morning, church. Uh, just to get my rhythm and routine and trying to focus. Uh, I think it was in the 90s when uh, we had a missions conference in Silvergren celebrating Africa Inland Missions 100th year. And one of the missionaries that challenged the group was Alan Burrix, his wife Loretta, who was serving in Madagascar in many years. Sad to say that uh, Carmen sent me a message from Facebook that he was stung by bees and he passed on. And uh, for more than 40 years I've known this gentleman. Last week we shared with Bim as well, missionaries that we are connected to more than 40 years and to see their passing. So. But uh, the Lord knows what's best. He also knows what's best as I share with you this morning. Thank you, Pastor, for the challenge that you've given to me uh, to share God's word with you all this morning. <clears throat> for the past couple of months, we have been hearing and inundated with a two-pot system that takes effect today. From the two-pot system, I want to change it into a two-pot sermon. <laughs> One of the pots that you will receive, you are the pots this morning, and I trust that you will receive it, empty your pots, clean those pots, and receive the message. And the other pot that will be sharing is this crack pot in front of you. <laughs> okay. Don't look it in the term that you are laughing about me, calling myself a crack pot. But I had to crack this pot, that whatever the Lord has filled me with, it will flow from those cracks into your pots uh, this morning. And I trust that you'll be inspired and blessed as we share God's word uh, with each other and be blessed as we listen to God's word. And thanks, you, thanks for coming so early this morning as we prepare for another long day of ministry. Sharing on the subject on the power of praise. The power of praise. You know that prayer is an attitude of the heart guided and led by the blessed Holy Spirit that we turn, he turns our hearts to the Father and we, he allows us to be in tune and in touch with him. And that he doesn't allow us to just budge into his presence like he doesn't budge in, into our lives. But we should cultivate an attitude of reverence and respect as our praise would always be to appreciate him and adore him. And uh, <clears throat> I share an illustration that has been so true in one, when we should have cell meetings in Chatsworth. I've given one of the guys to share in the cell group meeting that Wednesday, it was at uh, Enoch's uh, place in Unit 3. He shared on the subject the power of prayer. <clears throat> the next morning as we were walking to work, he was anxious because he's contract at work was coming to an end and what's going to happen to him as well. I said, hey, brother, you know what? You said on the power of prayer, so just focus on that and God will come through. And he said that, you know, when he was his, from his office, he was hungry and he went downstairs to get a meal and the cheapest meal was about 11 rand and he only had four rand in his pocket. But he had to survive till his mother makes him supper. And today he has such an abundance that he applied, I think he's in a manager's position from where he was, and now he's just praising the Lord. And I want to focus this morning in our praise that we will cultivate an attitude and habit of always praising God. Because praise is about having faith in the character of God, even if we are, even if we are struggling with challenges in our lives. It is when we choose deliberately to focus and believe in him and our faith that is exercised and it is that faith alone that pleases him and moves him to action in our lives personally and corporately. Praise is a weapon. The voice of praise is a weapon of war. It has value to the power of prayer. Scripture points us to many evidence of praises that results in victory. The portion of scripture that we read this morning allows me to share my first point about Jehoshaphat shouting praise when faced with a war. King Jehoshaphat called his army to shout with a praise when there was war looming in front of them. 
One of the most inspiring battle stories that we find in God's word is about this king winning a battle just by getting his singles and his army by focusing on praising God. There were three armies that were surrounding them. There were three armies that were attacking them. There were three armies that were going to pursue them and maybe destroy them. The Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Menuhites, they declared war on King Jehoshaphat. These were the nations that surrounded Judah. And obviously, obviously, this king was shaken to the core. This king was stressed. He was anxious. He was worried. He had these three armies that he had to contend with. And how can he face them? How can he win this impossible battle? He found this to be true when he faced these vast invading armies. Terrified, he called his people together and prayed. And they gathered together and they waited upon the Lord. And God has poured out his spirit on a Levite. Jahaziel, who heard from the Lord, and he made this profound statement that we are so used to and so understand that the battle is not ours, the battle is the Lord's. Three armies facing them, that's the reality. That statement came to them, and we are so, uh, we so acknowledge it today that our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers that the Lord Jesus Christ has destroyed and defeated on the cross. King Jehoshaphat believed God and he acted in faith. He appointed the singers to go ahead of the soldiers and sing praises to the God who will give them the victory that they would see. And by faith, I trust that whatever battle that you are facing, echo the sentiments of Jazil when he said that the battle is not ours, the battle is the Lord's. And as the music began, as the praises started, God miraculously defeated their armies. That's proof. And I trust that the battle that you're facing, hand it over to God and just say, God, you know what? The battle is not mine. The battle is yours. What do I do? Do I raise up an army trying to support me to push ahead my needs? May I raise up an army that will just focus on praising God? And the hymn writer says, at the shout of praise, else foundations cover. Else foundations cover at the shout of praise. And that is what we should be doing. Shake the very foundations of hell with our praises. And sometimes it's so hard and so difficult to do that when the very core of your heart and your being is being traumatized and troubled by whatever tribulation and whatever trials and struggles that you are going through. He loved to hear the praises of his people. He loved to hear you call upon his name. And let us focus on, like Joseph and his army did, in praising the Lord our God. King Joseph got his army and they shouted praise even when they faced a war. Even when they faced a war, Joseph Fett shouted with that praise. The next point I want to share is from Joshua chapter 6, verse 1 to 5, where Josh, Joshua faced the walls. Joshua faced the walls, and you know the story of uh, the Jericho walls as we turn to Joshua chapter 6, and we'll read from verses 1 to verse 5. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1 to 5, I'm reading from the King James Version. Now, Jericho was stately shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I've given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. 
And he shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horn, and on the seventh day he shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall send up every man straight before him. And the second point that I would share with you about Joshua and the walls that stood before them. Joshua's obedience to God's unique battle plan you don't fight this war with your weapons or with your army. And it was fought with sheer obedience. So the walls of Jericho was not battered down with the weapons of war, which would have made part of it fall out of place, but it fell within and as per God's plan and purpose. God chose this way to try and test the faith and obedience of his people. Whether they would observe a precept which to human policy seemed foolish and unreasonable or believe a promise that seemed impossible to be performed. Whether they could patiently bear the reproaches of the enemy and then wait patiently for the salvation from the Lord their God. Thus, by faith, not by force, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. No warlike preparations were made. By the uncommon method of besieging the city, the Lord honored the ark as a symbol of his presence and power and shown to the people that all victories were from in. All victories will be from him. The faith and patience of his people were proved and tested. So all the people shall shout with a great shout, accompanied by the blast of the ram's horns and the trumpets. Shouts of praise echoed by trumpets of jubilee. A miracle was needed would gave Jericho to Joshua. And here's another incident of what praises can do. Whether it's a war or whether it's these walls. These people shouted with such praises. It's loft, Jericho's lofty walls and well-fenced cities and gates made it simply impregnable to the Israelites. Nothing like a direct interference from God could within a week, within seven days, and over Jericho to Joshua. The shouts of praise heralded by the trumpets borne by priests, seven of them in number. The procession around Jericho were to be made on seven days, and on the seventh day, seven times just confirming the sacred number, which was an emblem more especially of the work of God. The number seven is quite unique and significant in God's word, appearing over 700 times throughout both the Old and New Testaments. In biblical numerology, seven symbolizes the completion or perfection. It is said that God created the world in six days, but he rested on the seventh. Those walls were strong. Those walls were sturdy. The people bask within those walls knowing of having such security and comfort that no army can touch them. No one can enter into Jericho, or go out of Jericho. Those walls were strong. And how can the Israelites going 
to go and possess the promised land by breaking through Jericho and seizing Jericho. It was his unique battle plan. Those walls that were so strong and steady would crumble down at the shout of grace. I trust that in your life, the route that you take, wherever you are rooted and grounded in, the path that is lying ahead of you, you will face many strong walls. You will face walls that will affect you. You will face walls that is impregnable. You will face walls that says, Lord, I just want to give up. I cannot go any further. I need someone to help me. And it is you, it is us. When we shout out those praises, those walls will come crumbling down. It, not may, it, not may, it may not be within a day. It may not be within two days. It may not be within seven days or seven times that you encompass these walls. But be assured, focus on praises and God will bring those walls and it will crumble. So I trust that as we hear about the praises of Jehoshaphat when he faced the war and Joshua when he faced the walls, we'll turn to Acts chapter 16 and our third point in jail after being whooped and wounded. A familiar portion of scripture from Acts chapter 16. Read from verses 22 to verse 26. <clears throat> Acts chapter 16. Continue reading from the King James Version. <clears throat> and the multitude rose up together against them, that is Paul and Silas, prior to verse 22. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and they sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. Verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Whether it's Jehoshaphat who faced the war, whether it's Joshua who faced the walls, here's a jailer who had to contend with wounded and whooped Paul and Silas. Paul received a Macedonian call as we read from Acts chapter 16, starting at verse and as he entered into Philippi, and here was this demon-possessed girl that started to annoy him, continuously stating who Paul is. The annoyance of the woman with the spirit of divination. However, she was delivered. This created a problem for the men who controlled her life and used their divining powers for their own personal gain. The hope of making money of her powers was now over as she was delivered by Paul on their way to a prayer meeting. Paul and Silas were handed over to the authorities. It is interesting, as we read prior to verse 22, that these men who controlled this demon-possessed girl did not mention the real reason of accusing Paul and Silas. They stated they had a deep devotion to Rome that was affected 
but in reality, the pockets were affected and the prophets. So the magistrates commanded that they be stripped and beaten with many stripes. There were many stripes that were laid on Paul and Silas and they were thrown into prison into the inner courts by the jailer. What would have been a normal, what would a normal person do under these circumstances after being beaten up with many stripes, after being accused so unfairly and so unjustly, and more than that, being thrown into prison, not just the ordinary prison, but right into the dungeons. What would any person do? Paul and Silas were absolutely uncomfortable to sleep. You are beaten. You are sore. Your body is sore. They had their backs reeling with pain. The future to them was just uncertain. Lord, we came here to receive this Macedonian call. And now we are in jail after being whooped and wounded. Satan often uses such circumstances to attack us spiritually. But Jesus Christ has defeated him on the cross. However, how did Paul and Silas respond? At midnight. At midnight, the word of God tells us they sang praises to the Lord. Now you are disturbing the peace of the other prisoners. They will gang up on you. Be careful. You are disturbing my sleep. Who in a right mind after being whooped and wounded is coming here at midnight and singing praises to God? And the Bible says the other prisoners were listening. Being in jail, they resorted to praise God. What were the remarks of the other seasoners, prisoners who were trying to sleep? from pain to praise. Though the bodies were bound and in pain, the spirits were set free. One whose spirit is free, though physically bound, is so much better than a man whose body is free, but his spirit is bound. Singing is a means and an attitude with praise to our God. The greatest way to explain our predicament, our problem, and our pain is to let it burst forth in praise with a song. Singing our praises to God is a great way of expressing our emotions to encourage us and the important part of our worship to the one we love and adore. Our spirits are lifted up in singing praises to the Lord our God. It takes our minds out of ourselves, out of our situation, out of our struggles and what we are suffering from our pains and fears, and it causes us to focus on the Lord our God. The Psalms records many of David's responses when he faced such opposition, and he burst forth in praising the Lord our God. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. But what happened in that instance? The hurt shook at the shout of praise. You want to shake your earth that is holding you down for others to experience that quiver, that earthquake. Shout praises to God. Everyone's chains were loose. They were set free. And the ordinary thing to do, hey, we are free. Let's escape. So many ardent prisoners were there, and this was an opportunity to escape. And the jailer waking out of his sleep. The honorable thing for him to do before he could face the authorities and be executed was to kill himself. That's the honorable thing to do. And Paul saw that. What was Paul's response? Don't do that. For we are all here. Don't do that for we are all here. Who is at all? The other prisoners that were listening at midnight to songs of praises touched their hearts 
rather than escaping a physical condition, they were spiritually set free. They didn't run away. The conversion of the jailer. As they were singing, yes, there was a great earthquake that opened the prison doors and broke their chains. The jailer was awakened by this earthquake. And Paul said, yes, we are all here. He trembled. What was his response? He asked. Good says, what must I do to be saved? That famous verse that we read in Acts 16, verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. We now see the hand of God and understand why God allowed Paul and Silas to suffer such injustice. God was wanting to reach the hardened heart of a jailer to bring salvation to him and his family. He was most probably played an important part of the church in Philippi, led from the Macedonian call. When God calls you out of your comfort zone, whatever your comfort zone is, and when he allows you to go through a period and to a time of such struggle and such suffering, and that from the context of your pain and persecution, enter into the gates of thanksgiving in a courtyard of grace. Move away from that condition into this courtyard of praise to our God and see what happens. See your deliverance. It's so hard. It is hard. It will be hard when you will face a war. You face walls. You may face after being whooped and wounded. What issues or circumstances that is at war within you or before you? Seems there are great enemies that are against you and you don't have the resources to counteract them. Echo the confidence of Jazeel when he said that the battle is not ours, the battle is the Lord's. Trust him. He is fighting for us. That's what he's doing. He's fighting for us. And he expects us as soldiers looking unto Jesus who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Not only what is warring within you or without you, but what are the walls that are surrounding you? Holding you back from pursuing a faithful commitment. Walls that seem sturdy and strong. Offering you security. Walls that seem impregnable. And your focus and hope that these walls will be removed. And the only way it is like Joshua and his army that surrounded these walls with praises to God. Let praise be a weapon that will bring your Jericho down. Focus on praising the Lord our God. This is our challenge today. The power of grace. Are we so physically inept and worn out that we don't have the capacity and strength to praise him? Broken with illness and infirmities, and the prison of our circumstances should keep us in chains. But we can rise above that and sing, my chains are gone, I have been set free. The voice of praise is a weapon that destroys the enemies of God and the armies of his people everywhere, anywhere, and anytime. Listen, church. They will be destroyed everywhere, anywhere, and anytime. And we need to use every resources that we have, wherever we are, and all the time to praise him. Because those praises confuses the enemy. In the Bible, there are various acts of how the power of praise was used in battles to help secure total victories. The power of praise and worship breaks the spirit of oppression, depression, and suppression of the enemy. Praise is a weapon that we must use as children of God to help us win our spiritual battles, help us engage in offensive spiritual warfare and seek the advancement and progression, progression of God's kingdom all the time. So when we praise God, we are commanding and demanding all beings to join us to acknowledge God and praise him and his mighty acts in creation. Praise is a great weapon of war 
for spiritual warfare. So today, church, yes, I know that we spend time quietly in praising the Lord our God, worshiping, considering the power of prayer, knowing and understanding, yes, it is the power of prayer that leads us to cry out to God on our knees, in our closets, in our war room. But when we just allow praises to take more than that, it's the weapon that we bring before those that seem to attack us. So let's rise above our circumstances. Let's lay aside the weight that holds us down and praise and worship the Lord our God. Trust today that we will move from our present condition, whatever it is, and move to focus in praising the Lord our God.